Welcome to another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Dana Black, coming to you live. Yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Um, if you're lucky enough, you have a snuggle buggle with you tonight in front of the fireplace. Because this is no type of weather to be in these streets. You know somebody like me, I love being in the streets. I ain't going nowhere, nowhere. So light up the fireplace, get you some cocoa, and then after turn left, not not right now, not right now, after turn left, watch a movie and just chill out and stay warm. Because I tell you what, the weather is really bad out there. Uh, our state police has already talked about how many crashes, how many slide offs, and how many pedestrians they've had to help. So if you don't have to be out on the streets, and I recognize some of our most critical people in our society have to be out. They have no other choice. So if you don't have to be out, don't get in their way. Don't get in their way. Stay off the streets. Stay home. Fix you some hot cocoa or hot toddy, whichever one makes you happy. <laughs> and sit back and watch Turn Left. Because you know, this week was that in week at the State House where the bills that pass in the House. They start transferring over to the Senate, and the bills that pass in the Senate transfer over to the House. And we already know there was some really, 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 really crappy bills, you know, 1134. There's a whole bunch more that'll be transferring. But can we just for a moment talk about, because there's no way I'm going to know about all the bills, right? But there were a few bills that came through that didn't make it, but wait till you hear <laughs> Wait till you hear what these Republicans, right, the, the, the pro-business party, the pro-business party. Wait till you hear what some of the stuff they were proposing. The Shelbyville News reports, Hoosier lawmakers have, uh, appears to have backed away from a proposal to prohibit the state from contracting with any company seeking to reduce its fossil fuel use or any business that does business with those companies. House Bill 1224, if enacted into law, potentially could have returned state government operations to the paper records and cash payments common in the 19th and 20th century. I do love the journalism here. You, you, you can't, I had to read that part, right? <laughs> anyway, as many of the nation's leading technology, banking, manufacturing, and retail organizations have pledged to reduce or eliminate their carbon output in the years ahead, primarily by replacing their use of electricity derived from coal and natural gas with renewable energy resources. I, see, our state is so forward and, and forward thinking and progressive and, and thinking about the future that they were writing a bill to prevent us from doing business with people who wanted to reduce their carbon footprint. The sponsor of the measure, State Representative Ethan Manning of Logansport said his goal was to send a message to big business and big banks that the General Assembly sets energy policy for Indiana, not corporate boards in far off places. <laughs> I mean, I giggle when I read it because, dude, um, I thought, I thought y'all said the market was supposed to determine everything. I thought y'all said y'all wanted less government. I thought y'all said, you know, we should make government so small that it just fits inside the side of a woman's uterus. That's it. <laughs> right? I mean, but now you trying to tell businesses how to do business. How does that work? I don't even understand how that works. Uh, other so-called dead bills include House Bill 1321, which would, uh, was mandating businesses to accept cash and provide change for all transactions. So the government, as they like to mock, you know, people, the government was going to make a business determine how they were going to do transactions. Again, thought we were small government. <laughs> I, I giggle at this stuff. And House Bill 1109 requiring non-alcoholic beverage companies to generally provide their product at the same price to every retailer. Huh? I thought I should be able to set my own price. If I can get you to pay more, I'm going to get you to pay more. There's no fair market price. How are you going to tell me how to set prices for my product? <laughs> and finally, 
Uh, state Joint Regulation Resolution 3, directing Indiana to join other states in calling a national constitutional convention to permanently set the number of U.S. Supreme Court justices at nine. See, th see now, now, real talk, this is a, a scaredy, scaredy boo tactic because, you know, luckily for these folks, President Biden is an institutionalist. And if he wanted to stack the court, he could stack the court. Because the Constitution doesn't have a limit on how many justices we can have on the Supreme Court. And <laughs> when, when, we, when we started this country, we didn't have oh, almost 400 million people living here. So if we actually expand the court and make it more representative of the, the country that it, would that it would govern, that it would represent, that'd be all right with me, but they're not going to do that. But hey, these are the same people who are absolutely losing their minds at the fact that President Biden has been committed to appointing a black woman to the Supreme Court. I mean, Ted Cruz is like, oh my God, this is insulting to black women. First of all, how dare you speak for black women because you couldn't even speak up for your own wife when he was talking about how, what she looked like. The orange menace was talking about what your wife looked like and you couldn't say nothing. So please keep your mouth off of black women. You don't know what we thinking and what we feeling. Go on, boy. I need you to man up. But no, you were too busy making phone calls to the dude who said your daddy <laughs> killed the Kennedys. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I can't take you seriously. You the same dude that ran off to Cancun when your constituents were freezing to death. Don't talk to me about what women are thinking. What you know? I also had some people here in the state of Indiana talking about this is an affirmative action pick and it shouldn't even matter what the race is. It should be about the most qualified. Um, hold up a minute. Let me think about this. Uh, the last three Supreme Court, ju court justices who were appointed were all white. Huh? So you mean to tell me there wasn't a black person, a Latino, an Asian, or anybody, anybody that was as qualified as any of those three people? Any of them? Get out of here. Why don't you just say you don't want nobody but white men on the Supreme Court? And the occasional woman every now and then. Just tell the truth. And how dare you suggest that we don't have, as black women, we ain't qualified. But you only think about that. You only talk about that when the, the default, the default white males are not considered. I'm going to need y'all to put y'all's feelings in your pocket. Y'all getting a little too sensitive for me. I'm going to need me some old frontiersmen. <laughs> Where y'all at? Because we've had a bunch of sensitive fellas running around here, but putting themselves in front of the cameras. All right, uh, a little something that I found was interesting. Uh, it kind of came across the wire late. The Opelika Auburn News reports Indiana General uh, Attorney General Ty Rakita took a state paid trip to the U.S.-Mexican border last week and attended the Donald Trump rally along the way. Rakita's office confirmed the trip was being paid for with official funds and that he drove, but didn't immediately re release details about the cost. The Republican Attorney General, General's trip was announced Thursday on his office's Facebook page, which said he was headed to the border to investigate the impact of illegal immigrants. Rakita joined several other Republican State Attorney Generals for a border security briefing, and he was among those interviewed Friday by Fox Business News host. Now, he said he drove six, another six hours to the rally. Am I paying for that too? Hmm. On Tuesday, Rakita sent out campaign fundraisers highlighting the trip. But my guy, my friend, Indiana Democratic Party spokesman Drew Anderson criticized Rakita and said, going to great lengths, even wasting taxpayers' dollars to win the appeal of the former president and a divisive set of culture wars that do nothing but divide Hoosier families across the state. Yep. Well, first of all, um, uh, I'm not really sure what you going to the border is going to do for Indiana. I mean, if you went down to like Louisville, I, I might have had some for you. If you'd have hung out in Jeffersonville for a little while, or you had headed over to Terre Haute for a little while, or you huddle, went over to Richmond, maybe went up to Michigan City. I might have been down with your border wanting to see what's going on. But you went to Texas and you using my money? Remember when y'all used to say, um, what was it? 
Democrats, oh, tax and spend. At least when we were spending, we were spending for the people and not just on ourselves. Dog, you are the worst. And we have an opportunity to do some real changes in this state, but we have to be committed. These are the kind of people who are fleecing us. They're grifters. They're fleecing our tax dollars. They're, they're trying to privatize public education. They're doing everything they can to take our tax dollars for their own personal gain. We should not be allowing this to happen. And the only way that we're ever going to stop this is if we galvanize and show up to the polls, get out, register voters, not just registering them, make sure that they understand why they're voting, what their interests are, and then help them get to the polls. Nothing's going to change if we are not involved. we got to remember there are more of us than there are of these, these big businesses or these people who are kowtowing to big businesses. Or the, there, Look, there's only one orange menace, but he, only, he seems to have a whole bunch of minions, especially that brown one down in Florida cracks me up. <laughs> I mean, many, many orange DeSantis. I don't know. I, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Because these guys, man, these guys, Hoosiers, I implore you, get involved. Next week, pay attention to these bills that have been the switched houses, switched chambers. Make sure you get on top of this. ISTA is fighting like cats and dogs right. to end 1134. Fine, go to their website, go to their Facebook page. They have some rallies that they're going to do, some, some um, statehouse action. Get with ISTA. I'm telling you, they're trying to fight, do the best they can. Go let these people know that the loud minority of people who don't understand history and feel some kind of way about the truth don't win over and drive our teachers out of Indiana. Because, you know, not only are they trying to drive licensed teachers out, they're trying to say, oh, it's okay to have unlicensed teachers. They got a bill that says, well, we have a teacher shortage. They don't recognize that the teacher shortage is because we don't pay them and we give them extra burdens. We turn them into the nurses. They got to give COVID tests. Now they got to post all their stuff online. All of this stuff. And then what they do when we have, when the licensed teachers leave, oh, no. You don't have to be licensed to teach. Who are we turning our children over to? Yes. All right. These are the things that are important. You guys got to get fired up. I'm always fired up. I'm always ready to go. And that's why tonight we we have two guests. One ain't enough. There's way, way too many Democrats out here on the ballot, and you need to know each and every one of them. So tonight, all the way to primary, for sure, I'm going to have – Two Democrats on when I have candidates on. We're starting tonight. First up, he's running for the Wayne Township trustee. Y'all give it up for my man, Jeb Barton. Jeb, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dana. It's really, it's great to be here. I've, I've watched your show for a long time, and I'm thrilled to be on it. Yay! Thank you for the invitation. Yay! And a returning guest, one of my homeboys, what, what? Y'all give it up, running for House District 59, my man, Ross Thomas. Ross, welcome to the show. Always good to see you, Dana. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and rant and rave with you tonight. I love it. So, Jeb, this is your, this is your maiden voyage on yes. Turn Left. <laughs> Won't you tell the people who you are and where you come from? Well, I'm a, I'm a West Sider, been uh, born and raised on the West Side of Indianapolis, uh, Wayne Township. Uh, has been my home my entire life. Um, I actually, my wife and I live um, in a house that is um, 200 feet from the house I grew up in. Um, and our back door neighbor I've known for the last 47 years. So I'm, I call the West Side home. Um, I am a, a small business owner. This is my 25th year um, as a Subway restaurant franchisee. Um, I spent 14 years in the Indiana legislature uh, a decade ago before gerrymandering. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm the father of two wonderful daughters. I've got a, a sophomore at IU and a junior at Short Ridge. Is she a sophomore already? Yes. It just so seems like it was the other day I visited the school. Flying by. Wow. Yep. Ross, tell the people who you are and where you come from. I come from Lovett, Indiana. Uh, <laughs> the road? <laughs> I... I, uh, I grew up on a farm in Jennings County, um, and I'm an attorney. 
Um, I've been practicing law in Indiana since 1995. Um, grew up, as I said, in Jennings County. Graduated from uh, Jennings County High School there. Uh, went to college at Tulane University in New Orleans. Um, got a degree in political economy, uh, which is about as worthless as it sounds. Um, as far as getting a job. So I came back to Indiana, went to law school um, uh, at IU uh, in Indianapolis and uh, been a criminal defense lawyer for the last going on 27 years. I have my own practice in Indianapolis. Um, my wife and I have lived in Columbus, Indiana for the last 18 years going on 19. I, I always know that because we moved down there from Indianapolis when my wife was pregnant with our oldest, and I know how old he is. So we've been <laughs> proud Columbus residents for um, for almost two decades now, and we have three kids uh, in the Bartholomew County Public Schools, and um, I've been involved in Democratic politics for a little while. Um, was a candidate previously. Um, didn't know I was going to be a candidate again, really, and and kind of molded over. And it turns out that uh, the our current representative in uh, District 59 is apparently a crazy person. Um, you know, <laughs> is that is that is that uh, who is that? Which one is that? Is that Ryan Lauer? Oh. Uh, Ryan Lauer, who who called uh, uh, vaccination fascism. Uh, <laughs> Ryan Lauer, who is uh, who is uh, tr trying to um, destroy public schools and and uh, all of the traditional Republican craziness, but really when when he went off the deep end on vaccinations, look, you can you can have difference of opinion of a lot of things, but when your opinion kills people, um, it's time for people to stand up and say you need to shut up now. You don't know what you're talking about. And if people are going to listen to you, they're going to die. So um, that's why I'm in this race, uh, one of many reasons, uh, but certainly to protect public schools. As I said, I've been a criminal defense lawyer for 25 years or more. I, I want to see marijuana legalized in this state. I've wanted to see that my whole career. I can tell you uh, firsthand the horror stories of, of how our war on weed has ruined people's lives. Um, and, you know, we need to end that. And that's something that I'm, I'm so happy that the Democratic Party has fully embraced this issue, because it's been an issue for me for a long time. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that, you know, everybody else is, is on board in, in the platform to say that that's something we need to do. We know we need better wages and, and man, we just need to get the insanity out of the state house. So I'm, I'm ready to go. And I'm not Can we get an money. exterminator for that? I mean, is that, I is there an insanity exterminator? Is so, somewhere? I, I don't know. I, you know, I hope so. And I, and my, my hope is that most people, as you mentioned it, we were talking about the crazies at the school board, right? The, the vocal minority. My hope is that it's more of a minority than these people think. That it's more of a minority that, than um, Ryan Lauer thinks. That the people that he's catering to, you know, that dog don't hunt with most people. And, and I hope that's true. And, Absolutely. And we're going to offer them a, a, a sane alternative that protects public schools and, and fight for working people. Absolutely. I'm glad you said fighting for working people because a lot of the legislation that is coming out of our state house is detrimental to working people. And when people are struggling, they turn to the trustee's office. Jeb, talk about what got you involved, wanting to be involved. You were in the state house. You, you had a nice career. You chilling. You got your business. You got your girl. I met your family. I love your family. Why are you back out here? And the trustee's office is one of those places where it's, it's hard work. Well, I, I, the legislator, legislature, uh, you know, in 2011, uh, redistricted, used gerrymandering to an extreme. Mm -hmm. And so there were, there were a lot of us um, who found our districts had moved significantly. Uh, 
Um, mine happened to leave the county. Uh, it's up. It's up in Tippecanoe County now. Um, and I found myself in uh, my good friend Vanessa Summers district. So um, we weren't going to run against each other. Um, and I, I threw my support behind her immediately. Oh, hold up. Time out. Before you go any further, check that out. Do y'all see what that means? Y'all make room for black people. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> make room. Well, v Vanessa uh, represents our district well, and I'm, I'm, she really is a good friend. Um, we, uh, so anyway, long story short, 10 years later, um, I didn't expect to find myself in this situation, um, but through a, a series of events, unfortunate events, um, I felt like I needed to step in and, and try and um, make things right in the trustee's office. And so I'm, um, I'm a candidate. There, there are some things that we've got to tackle immediately. And obviously with the pandemic, the challenges of taking care of people have just magnified significantly. Um, and so it, there's, a, there's really a need. Wayne Township leads the, uh, the city in evictions. And so the, the, the challenge of helping folks who've lost their homes, um, it's, it's big. It, it, it's probably the biggest issue facing us right now. Absolutely. And, you know, this is one of those races where, oh, by the way, y'all, before we go any further, if you like either one of these candidates, I have included on this Facebook Live their link. If you like something they're saying, click on the link and donate to them. You can just do it. It'll pop up in another window. You don't even have to leave the show. Stay with the show. But you should donate to these candidates if you are liking a, a, what they stand for or you like their vision. Support them. All right. So, you know, uh, the trustee's office is, is one of those that is closest to the people. You know, we, we always say politics is local. It can't be any closer than uh, people needing assistance and coming to the trustee's office. Tell us what, what some of the roles that happen in the trustee's office, because some people don't know. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a complicated thing in Indianapolis because different trustees have different roles. Uh, in Wayne Township, uh, one of the primary roles of the, the trustee is to oversee uh, fire and EMS services. So about a half of the, uh, the township is served by a, uh, a fire district. Um, we have five, five fire stations that serve the Wayne Township Fire District, um, and we provide ambulance service. So one of the I mean, primary functions is public safety. It's uh, making sure that, that not only are our residents safe, but also um, our firefighters and am ambulance uh, staff. So that's, that's a key. Um, and then the, the second role we've already touched on, which is providing emergency services. And in, in Wayne Township, uh, as I mentioned with the eviction issue um, and homelessness um, and just folks struggling with poverty, um, there is a, there's a significant need. Um, and we've got to find ways uh, to expand those services. Um, you know, pandemic really highlighted mm -hmm. that the township needs to provide services, not only at the trustee's office, but throughout the township. And not only uh, in person, but also uh, virtually, we've got to we've got to modernize the office. Um, and so those are those are things I'm really um, focusing on. Um, the other, the third responsibility of the trustee is to take care of uh, abandoned cemeteries. And thankfully, we only have one of those in Wayne Township. Um, but that's that's also a, a job for the trustee. I didn't even know that one. See that yeah. one. That one's let me. That's an interesting gig. It's Mount Jackson Cemetery that's adjacent to uh, Central State over off of uh, Tibbs and Washington Street. Well, is, is, is that building still there? It's been so long since I've been over uh, in that area, the, 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 old build, the old Central State building. Part, part of it. And I I'd, actually, I would invite you to go visit. It's probably one of the most unique museums in the state of Indiana, but the Indiana Medical History Museum was the pathology lab for Central State. And it was also a, a place for teaching um, doctors early on. And so it, it's really an amazing uh, tour. Um, has a great history of the entire property. Yeah, I love it. You'll also be amazed to see that property because it's being redeveloped. I mean, there are the housing, um, I don't know, probably 100 acres of new housing out there. Well, and you know, that, that's something that, in, and both of you guys kind of chime in on this one because this is going to take both of us because I'm seeing a lot of gentrification in Marion County. I'm seeing it all over the state. Um, the problem is, though, it's not affordable housing, right. right? We have people who, you know, you're talking about from the trustees' perspective and you're talking about it, Ross, from um, a policy perspective. 
you know, let's talk about affordable housing. That is the thing that seems to be eluding everyone at all levels of government. How do we address? We understand that businesses are in business to make money. I understand that. But if a person can't, you know, if people are out here homeless or struggling or living paycheck to paycheck because they're house poor, because they can't afford where they live, how do we talk about that and, and then maybe offer up some ideas? And, and if everybody knows who's ever been on my show, I do not send the questions in advance. So they have no idea I was going to ask this question. But, you you know, we talk about this. Affordable housing is scarce. How do we mm -hmm. deal with that? What are some discussions we should be having, guys? Well, I, I will I will say, you know, you mentioned um, these companies are in business to make money. But if you look at most of these projects, they're all getting a handout from from the government in some way. Uh, they're getting a tax abatement. Uh, they're getting um, f free infrastructure. They're getting something from the government. Um, so, yeah, all well and good to, uh, hey, I'm going to spend my money. I'm going to build housing. I'll charge whatever I want. I would say in my state, if you're going to take our money through a tax abatement, then whatever you're going to build is going to include affordable housing. It's going to include workforce housing, you know, and I think that's good for two reasons. One, it means that we're not subsidizing, you know, millionaires um, if they're not bringing something back to the community. And two, in my opinion, I think we've learned from the past having affordable housing that is spread out through the community as opposed to here's the projects. Right. Speak is better for everyone so once one of the things that i would do absolutely is say you do what you want but if you want if you want a free road in front of your place uh you're gonna have affordable housing in there i love it yep absolutely and i i think uh from a trustee standpoint um just the, the idea of keeping folks in their homes i mean it it comes down to in some cases uh assistance with utilities or assistance with weatherization um, things that they're so affordable to help with and and the the outcome of that investment is you keep somebody in their home um, so I, I think as a trustee um, bringing folks together to, to coordinate those resources because it's not all just going to come out of the trustee's office there are all all kinds of programs around the county to help folks um, I mean our school districts are doing things to help people stay in their homes. So how do we take those programs and enhance them and, and uh, bolster the outcome? Oh my God, I love it. Cause you guys came from two different perspectives. Uh, how we establish new space for new affordable space and how do we keep people in? Because you know what? Keeping people in is how we build generational wealth or generational, you know, my, my parents were able to, my parents both came from very, very humble beginnings but they did what they had to do. They saved and paid off their home. And so when it was time for uh, my sibling and I to decide, we were able to sell that. And I, I, it wasn't a whole lot of money, but it was enough for me to buy my own place. And yes. now I'm in a good place and having affordable living conditions because my parents were able to take care of themselves and they were able to pass it down. A lot of people don't have that. And if, we, and if we're kick, getting people kicked out, of their homes, they will never be able to like build that generational wealth and pass some of that down. It's so, so important. Thank you guys. That was so amazing. Now that state house though, we, I just talked about how they are literally passing legislation that you talked about uh, uh, being able to help them with their, their utility bills. We have companies that are like, yo, we got to figure out a way to reduce our carbon footprint. That'll also help us reduce costs. We have legislators right now who are saying, no, nah, let's continue to use dirty fuel. Let's continue, continue to use dirty coal. Um, let's continue to, you know, make Evansville, you know, the, the super polluter capital of the world, right? Um, and, and so how do we, what is with these Republicans? I'm going to ask y'all, what are with these Republicans and their anti-business bills? You can't make it up. I mean, it's as crazy as it's ever been. Um, uh, and I... I in my 14 years there, I saw some things that I would put in the you know twilight zone, um, but this this just continues to devolve into you know how crazy of a thought can we come up with? Um, and I, I really do think you know if you if you really want to drill into it, 
the, the two issues that seem to fuel it, uh, besides Trumpism, um, are the way the maps are drawn, um, and then the, the presence of dark money. Um, mm. you know, the, the the GOP has really become a uh, a mouthpiece for some corporate donors and some billionaires who don't reflect working class people. Not at um, all. And, they, and they've duped them. They've duped yeah. them. Well, go ahead, Ross. We, we, we... I will tell you that, you know, that that bill about what who banks can do business with is, is anti-business. Yes, it's anti that business, but it's certainly not anti-coal and anti-oil. And so all of these guys are bought and paid for. And, you know, one thing that people learn are shocked to learn sometimes is that there aren't any limits on how much a, uh, a candidate can receive at the state level. And there's also no ethics requirements for receiving gifts from anyone. Now, if you're a forest ranger um, at a state park, if somebody gives you a sandwich, you got to fill out three forms and say, I got a gift. If you are a state legislator, you can get a suite at the uh, ball game every night and you don't have to report anything. The lobbyist has to report it on a, a web page that I challenge you to go find, but the legislators can take, as, and believe me, they do. So, you know, we need to have reform of campaign contributions. We also need to have reform on just flat out bribery because we see that from lobbyists day in and day out. You know, here, go, go use my condo in Florida before you vote on my bill. It's insane. Um, and those guys have always been on the take and, and it's not gonna change till we throw them out. Well, well, how about the fact that, you know, the, what you said was here, I'm the lobbyist, use my condo before you vote on my bill. There's, lobbyists shouldn't even have bills. And it's perfectly legal in Indiana, no rules. Uh, and that's and that's so scary because I mean we are, we don't even know where the dark we, we don't know where the dark money's coming from we don't know when they're being influenced we don't know how impactful it's going to be other than this is what these guys want regardless of what the people want but but this is the thing that I I struggle with I've been struggling with it since I've been out here talking about you know getting involved in civic engagement how do we get people to recognize that, that all of this stuff is like counter to their best interest. You don't want to be rude and be dismissive about what they think and they feel, but what, how do we highlight to them like, yo, this really ain't helping you? It, that's, that is the key question. I mean, I, we're talking, sitting here talking about utilities and I opened my light bills up um, the last two months and I'm, I'm just flabbergasted. I don't know about everybody else. But something's happened to the light bill, <laughs> and everybody I know is saying the same thing. Um, I, I, to circle back though to what R Ross was talking about, I, I think he's exactly right. Um, the, the idea there is no transparency. Uh, you can't go very easily and find anything about where the the cash flow is, um, and the gifts are. It's it's undermining to the credibility of our government. Um, I got in there uh, in the legislature and got very uncomfortable very quickly. Um, and I took a no free lunch policy, um, as did several of my friends. And it made made me feel a little bit better about the process because every every lobbyist knew that if we were going to go to lunch, I was buying my own, my own meal. Um, and I think we need that in, in all levels of government, um, along with the transparency. I think people need to have... Um, credibility restored to, to government. Wouldn't it be awesome if they put the same energy and fervor into transparency about their gifts as they are about teacher curriculum? <laughs> Just to tell you what, where, how money talks in this state house. I mean, there, one, of the, one of the current uh, bills coming forth is basically a loan sharking bill for payday lenders to raise um, interest for the most vulnerable people uh, to 36% interest 
um, for these ridiculous payday loans, which ought to be illegal to begin with. It's a loan shark. But but if you're going to do it, you should you should limit the um, amount of interest that somebody has to pay, not basically make it unlimited so a person is in debt for their entire life. I don't know anybody that would say, you know, who needs help in this world are the predatory lenders, but yet our state house seems fine with that. Well, guess what? They're also getting a lot of money from those scumbags uh, who are then uh, trying to, to, again, the most vulnerable people. I mean, if you've ever needed a payday loan, you're in a bad spot. Right. You're, be, you're in a bad spot. And, you know, we ought to make it easier for people uh, through community banking. And, and there's all kinds of, you know, um, micro loan systems. There's all kinds of creative ways to get money to people that need it. But the last way to do it is, is through a loan shark. But right. right. That, that's yep. where our state legislature is. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the idea that the people who are, are even considering these bills can't ever imagine themselves in a position where they need help, would they want that? Like, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. How difficult is that to do? Right. And Dana, Dana you touched on, I think, one of our mutual favorite people, uh, Todd Rokita. But I, when I was uh, chair of the Financial Institutions Committee in the House, we created, we passed a, a bill, became law, and created the Homeowner Protection Unit. So there, there is law in place. There is um, an entity in place that could be doing so much to help people um, hold on to their homes, be protected against predatory lending. Um, we, we identified that, and we went after it, and we got bipartisan support to do it. Um, but it takes an attorney general uh, who oversees that that unit to do the job right. Um, and right now in Indiana, it's not happening. Well, no, because that dude down there in, in, at the Mexico border, you know, he ain't got time for Indiana. Yeah. He's more worried about Texas. And, and listen, I mean, they want to talk about illegal immigrants, and I get that part, and, and people have been waiting in line and all of that, all of that. But honestly, there's a reason why they are coming over. There is something here for them other than, oh, I just want to go to America. No, there's an opportunity for them to make money because there are businesses who are paying them under the table. Nobody ever wants to go after the businesses that are enticing these folks to come over to the over the border illegally. They're not doing that, right? They want to go after the poorest, most marginalized, the people that need the help the most. And Ty Rikita ought to be ashamed of himself. He should be protecting us when he is spending, spending our money on some stuff he probably don't even understand. Real talk. Anytime you yep, can put together the parents' right bill of bill of rights, and it was so singularly focused that you forgot that if you write this, that means black parents, Asian parents, Hispanic parents can have a say. But you didn't. You didn't think about them. I think Todd Rokita has proven in his public life for the past twenty years that he has no shame. So I, I don't think he's going to be ashamed of himself anytime soon. No. The no, unfortunate thing is, you know, he is the as as an attorney, you know, I I take I take my job seriously. I, I take our our laws seriously, our ethical obligations very seriously. He's supposed to be the top lawyer for the state of Indiana as the attorney general, right. um, and he is totally unqualified for that job, um, and has never been a, a distinguished lawyer in any way. Um, and all he's doing is taking that position to, um, you know, use his power for raw politics when he has a real job, which is to be the top attorney representing the state of Indiana. And it's just, it's pathetic. Um, but, you know, People knew who he was when they voted for him, and that's what they got. Did they really, though? I don't think they did. I mean, I, I think they say, oh, he's been around for a while, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, unfortunately, he is not on the ballot this year. Right. He's just, a, he's just, I almost said a bad word. Y'all, <laughs> y'all have, <laughs> I almost said something horrible. 
So, you know, education is that thing um, that is big. And, and, you know, Jeb, you talked about how sometimes the, the, the school districts are helping families. Obviously, right. there's legislation that's coming in and out uh, of the state house. I mean, luckily, there was a bill that didn't get called into committee that would have basically, again, taken over Gary's schools. I mean, my God, you know, you I, I'm going to say this, and y'all don't have to, re, you know, uh, nod your head at anything, but I'm really kind of sick of rural white, you know, Republicans trying to dictate <laughs> in the majority minority communities about what they need to be doing in their school system. I, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really over it, but luckily, you know, Senator Melton and, and the, the folks from the region, uh, you know, scuttled that one and, and it's out of the way, but education is, is such a huge topic. And I, I don't even think it's about in my opinion, about educating the kids, it's about the tax dollars that have been constitutionally earmarked for public education and how we go get that. Let's talk about public education or education in general and how you guys see Indiana, and in the th especially in Indianapolis, because um, this is another county that they want to bring their little grubby paws into trying to mess it all up. Talk about public education and your thoughts on that. It, you, you uh, you're exactly right, and it, it, the dollars are being siphoned away. Uh, I, 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 my biggest frustration is, you know, when you hear the stories about the virtual charter schools that defrauded, I think close to 150 million from the state of Indiana. That's money that not only came out of Indianapolis and Gary, uh, that came out of every school district in the state. Every one. Uh, we all lost. Um, and that's that's becoming a recurring theme. Um, we're, we're losing money here in Indianapolis. We have um, charter schools that are going under. Um, and right. And you, you look at it and you go, you know, not only are we losing tax dollars, but we're losing children. Mm -hmm. Because you, you create that instability um, and you leave them to fall through the cracks. And there are more and more cracks. Um, and less security and stability within our, our public education system. Absolutely. Well, you know, we've got a lot of attention right now uh, on public schools because we've got, you know, people storming uh, school boards. We're, you know, we're talking about CRT and, and burning books and all of the nonsense. But I would tell you that public education has been under attack in Indiana for a long, long, long time. Yep. And my bitch, we, have, I mean, mm. we have people, we have people in our government that actually don't believe in public schools. Mm -hmm. They think, hey, look, my money should educate my kid. And if I don't have kids, I, you know, you're all on your own. It's a crazy libertarian Koch brothers idea that's been around for a long time. Um, and everything that they do um, about education is for that ultimate goal of let's not do it at all. Right. What they really want to do, what they really see is, hey, you know what? The government is pretty good at collecting money uh, through sales tax and fees and property tax. And, and so, I mean, not income tax, because we, we, you know, don't take our money, but boy, that other money that you collect, you know what would be good? Why don't you just give it to us and we'll give it to our friends? And that's what they do in so many things. You know, at public education, hey, why build a road when we can sell it to somebody and they can rent it back to us? I mean, it's ludicrous, but that's that's the mentality. So we've been attacking public education for forever. And, you know, attacking collective bargaining, attacking teachers, um, and trying to take it with the ultimate goal of, hey, why don't you just give us that money and and we'll we'll spend it right. You know, you mentioned, Jeb, those virtual schools. Who couldn't see that that was a boondoggle when they did it? Right. I mean, but of course, lots of money changed hands. People so, made a ton of money. Lots of money changed hands. So look, we should be very concerned about politicizing school boards. We should be very concerned about a bunch of nuts saying we're going to burn books. But we should be also concerned that 
at the end of the day, they don't want us to have a public school, which, which in my opinion is the most important uh, institution in every town in Indiana. Is um, we need to be supporting teachers. We need to be expanding collective bargaining, giving them power, uh, not dividing teachers and denigrating teachers with the ultimate goal of destroying their profession. So yep. I think it's something that everybody ought to be very concerned about. Um, we see what's happening. We know that charter schools, for the most part, um, drain money from the system. We know that all of those promises made about, oh, this will be so much better. Um, it's ridiculous. We talk about, oh, look, those, those, the best students in that struggling school should be able to go to a better school. Well, first of all, it's not a better school. And second of all, what about the struggling student in the struggling school? You know, if we take the best student out of every school, that, that may help that student, but it's not going to help the teacher. It's not going to help the other kids. It's not going to help the See, culture. And, and my question is always, why is the school struggling? Why well, is this, if, 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 if all public schools get money out of the same pot, why are any schools struggling? What is the problem? What is, what is the reason the school is struggling? What is the measurement that says that the school is struggling? How do we know it's struggling? What is the metrics that tells us that that school is struggling? And oh, by the way, did you decide that, that the school was struggling from way up in Crawfordsville and you don't know nothing about what's going on in Evansville or in Muncie? How, what, that's the well, that ought to be the, that ought to be the question, right? What the, the, the thing ought to be, oh, we have a struggling school. Let's fix the struggling Let's school. Fix the school. Not, hey, here's an opportunity to drag some of the best students out, take the money out of the school, make it even worse. Um, look, there are lots of things we can do to improve public education, but first and <laughs> foremost, man, we, we've got to be supportive of the institution, not of a mindset that we'd be better off without public schools. And it's as scary as it is, that's what a lot of those people think. Go ahead, Jerry. There's been, there's been an accomplice uh, driven by profit in, in the tearing down of our public education system. And that's our testing system. I mean, the, the, the process put in place to try and label schools involves Indiana spending hundreds of millions of dollars on testing with companies that, I mean, frankly, they're they're driven by money, um, and the, and the numbers they're providing us and and how they label kids, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's corrupt. Uh, listen, real talk. You know, I was one of those kids that you know back in the day they would still put you on a track, and especially if you were an African American kid, if you didn't like score like genius level, they may put you in a slower track. And luckily for me, I talked so much that they were like. Okay, we got to give her something else to do. Otherwise, I could have slipped through the cracks. But the stigma, real talk, and this happened to me, real talk, I felt like I was never smart enough to do anything, right? I, rem I was well into my 30s before I recognized, shoot, I keep taking orders from people who are actually intellectually challenged. I bet I can go to college. And literally, that's what happened because I had been in. So now, what I'm saying is like, let's not do that to kids. Not let's let's not do that right. to, to testing in the testing process because again, I, my personality was big enough that I could shake it off. Everybody ain't like me, right? right? Everybody ain't like me. So let's stop that. Let and let's let teachers teach because if somebody right. has a passion to to go into an industry that does not properly compensate, does not properly you know, give them the tools that they need. Like I ain't never worked on an assembly line and I had to go buy the parts for the sub assembly. I mean, teachers got to go and buy the, buy the tools to do their job. And that, right. that means they got a passion for teaching kids. Let them teach, let them teach the material. I had amazing, amazing teachers that helped me blossom and helped me think about things in a different way. So there's, there's, Opportunities, even in, you know, when I gave the complaint just a minute ago, I can always pinpoint people like Mr. Ilardi, my electronics teacher, who made sure that I understood how important electronics was. Oh, by the way, guess what? I'm a tech chick now. So, you you, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, yep. I, I, I struggle with this idea 
of because one thing that dro drove me nuts and i ended up having a conversation with the ips school board um chair at the time they were they had a whole set of curriculum for certain schools in one in, at certain schools in the district and a, another set of curricula in another school in the same district how are you div and literally it was about the neighborhood that the school was in. So if it was in the uh, Meridian, Hills, Butler, Tarkington area, the IPS curriculum was much more stringent than if it was over at Vice Speedway on Mola Road or over over on Post Road. Well, what, 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 what's the difference? These are still students that need to be challenged and think differently and think critically, but y'all saying, okay, they're not worth the trouble? And she at the time, she really said, well, it was about money. So, so these kids ain't worth the money? And that's what's, we got to stop this. Why not make every school amazing and then give every kid an opportunity to learn and grow and blossom instead of creating five different types of schools? Jeb is right. You know, I mean, I like so many things that we, we look at in Indiana. Ultimately, we follow the money. Um, and uh, right, standardized testing is a boondoggle. It's it's a way to take our money, but it's also a way to label teachers, to denigrate teachers, to denigrate schools, um, to separate people. It, it, it doesn't work for education, but when your ultimate goal isn't education, it doesn't matter. You know, exactly. one thing I would, I would point out, none of these ideas are homegrown in Indiana, okay? I, I, had, I had my campaign staff look uh, at, at the some 300 and some bills that are be, being put forth this year, 110 were written by or inspired by ALEC, right. uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, basically a think tank for right wing nuts that says this is what you're supposed to do. And most of these controversial bills and most of these bills that we think are nuts, they, they're not homegrown. They're being told by billionaires who say, hey, look, here's your agenda. And it's anti-public school, it's anti-working people, it's anti-environment, um, and here it is. And they sign on and say, here's my bill, when it's taken word for word by what a bunch of billionaires said, th these are your marching orders. And so we cannot break through. And that's the part that's killing me, right? We have 6 million Hoosiers. 6 million Hoosiers that need all kind of assistance, all kind of services, and only, you know, 1% is 1%, no matter what. But the, the other 99% need assistance, they need, you know, certain s services to make sure that we can survive in our state. And we got these people writing legislation that is counter to the other 99%. I, it, it kills me, it kills me. It kills. And you know what, y'all mentioned the environment, and let's just get, let's go there. Because, you know, I, I would like for these people to not kill the next generation. I personally don't have any offspring, but I still care about the ones that are coming up. You know, when we see people saying we don't want to move away from fossil fuels when we know better, what is that saying about, you know, what we want to leave for the next generation? It says money talks. I mean, it, it, it always goes back to that with this legislature. And that is, if you've got enough money, they don't care. You know, we, we've got, you know, we've got uh, cancer clusters around the state um, that come from uh, uh, spills that have never been cleaned up. Cancer got clusters in areas that don't have health care facilities. How about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yep. And we've got, we've got, you know, we're, we're last in the country in water quality. Why? Because the people who are polluting um, are going to take you to St. Elmo's. And, and the people who are getting cancer ain't going to St. Elmo's. So guess what? Here's what we're doing. It's ridiculous. But the only way to fix it is to throw them out. It, it, it really is. It's a culture that is never going to change. Their mentality is money talks. And unfortunately, the people with the money are doing some really bad things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. I, and, you know, I, for some of the challenges that we face in Wayne Township are truly environmentally related. I mean, we, we have our own share of cancer clusters. Um, 
unfortunately, we have almost a regular occurrence of an industrial fire. It's either at the uh, one of the recycling plants or, uh, I mean, we, they just occur in the area. And so folks are exposed to all kinds of pollutants. Um, I've worked, at, at, we talked about my, uh, who I am. The other part of who I am is I'm involved in uh, some community organizations, one of which is called Reconnecting Our Waterways. Um, it is in part an environmental group. Um, and one of the issues besides pollution that we've been battling is um, the amount of litter and, um, and illegal dumping and the neglect that we're seeing um, within our neighborhoods and within our community. Um, I, I see environmental issues both at an industrial level, but also um, at a residential level. And I think we've got to address the whole spectrum of it. I love it. I love it. Y'all, can y'all believe our hour is, is pretty much up? I mean, this is lively. Ross, you and I, whenever we get together, it's always lively. So, you know, um, Ross, uh, so Jed, you've got the convention coming up Saturday. What is yes. the message that you have for Indiana Precinct Committee folks so they cast a vote for you uh, at this convention? So it's the Marion County Democratic Convention. It's virtual this year. Um, we have 89 uh, precinct folks in Wayne Township who are eligible to vote. Um, I am the only candidate who's filed within uh, the Democratic Party here in Marion County. Um, and my message to them is uh, we've got our work cut out and we need to work together. Um, I've, I have a history of working with folks from both sides of the aisle, um, but we've got to unite and tackle some of these challenges. Um, I mean, they're, they're huge and it's going to take all of us to fix them. Excellent. Now tell the people where they can find you. Uh, www Jeb for trustee. Um, I'm on Facebook, Jeb Barden for Wayne Township trustee. Um, and you've got my act blue account there. Um, I, I'm on the internet. I love it. Ross, go and give them your elevator pitch so they can support you. Well, I will, I will say for myself and, and the party, the state party is having a, uh, a stop of their jobs and weed tour um, down in Columbus on February 12th. Um, I think Tom McDermott's going to be there. I think Ed Delaney's going to be there. A couple of other folks and myself um, a good chance to come out and meet some candidates um, and talk about um, some of the things Democrats are for, um, would invite everybody to come down there. Um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna run a, a pretty loud campaign. Um, you know, I've run in the past and my thought was always, Hey, you know what? There's more Republicans than there are Democrats. So we're just going to reach out to the Democrats and we're not going to make much noise and hopefully the Republicans will stay asleep. And I don't think that's a bad strategy in many cases, but in this race, my opponent wants to kill people. So I want to stand up and be loud. Um, to be loud, that takes money. So I hope people can support our campaign um, so we can uh, get that message out that there is an alternative to um, worrying about, um, you know, whether the 2020 election was stolen. You know, that, that's really not an issue that's affecting us, but yet, you know, my opponent seems to think that's important. So we want to talk about public schools. We want to talk about legalizing marijuana. We want to talk about wages. Uh, we want to talk about the environment and we want to talk about getting corruption out of the state house as we talked about here today. So I think our website is voterossthomas.com. Um, we're also on the social media as well. We appreciate people checking us out and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight, Dana, and we yes. talk all night. <laughs> oh, man. Let me tell you something. Y'all energize me tonight. I, I'm usually a pretty hype chick, but y'all got me at 10 plus tonight. I love having good conversations with good Democrats who are talking about the people and what the people need, pulling the curtain back on the BS and calling it like it is, and they do it so politely. They're not like me. They're not all angry. Yeah, I'm an angry black woman. Write it down. <laughs> I have every right to be angry because guess what? It is Black History Month. And we are going to start our month off in Indiana talking about why we don't want to talk about black history. Or how some people are extra sensitive about the rawness of American history. So listen here. 
Uh, Alabama's already had some complaints that uh, discussing black history during Black History Month uh, is CRT. So I remember when all these people were like, no, we want to teach history. We want to just teach the facts. But if you're complaining about Black History Month already in Alabama, trust me and believe it's coming to Indiana soon. So if mm-hmm. 1134 gets passed, they go, <laughs> the onion, we just going to skip over February. Right? Y'all, th- this thing, th- these culture wars, although they are happening, and yes, bills are coming down the pike, they, there's an ultimate end goal. The ultimate end goal, for one, is they're having these discussions in suburban Indiana or suburban places around the country because they lost the suburban vote. They lost the suburban vote because they had a, a molester who was orange in the, sta- in, the, in the White House. And they lost it. So what is the tried and true method to get white folk fired up? Racialized fear mongering. It yep. happens every time, Willie Horton. It happens every time. Oh, my God, I don't want my little white daughter sitting next to the big, black, scary boy. It happens every time. This one is literally, oh, we don't want to corrupt the minds because they don't feel good. I read an article the other day that talked about how a child felt ashamed because they didn't see themselves in the history lesson. So although you guys want to talk about how little white kids be feeling all guilty about blah, 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 Think about the the institutionalized damage you are causing to everybody else because y'all too sensitive and too fragile to deal with the historical facts that happened in this nation. We did some really crappy stuff to each other. It was really, 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 really bad. But if we don't learn from it, we're going to continue to repeat it, i.e., how many times we going to burn books before we le- realize we shouldn't burn books? Are Amen. we having that discussion again? But that's why it's important. And if you need to know who these candidates are, Tammy Dixon, I see you, Tammy Dixon Tatum. I'm going to send you a note later. I need to get you on the show. Listen, follow Turn Left, follow Team Action, so I can share with you about all the people that are trying to represent you and figure out how you can help them if it's in your heart to do. Either donate sign up to be a volunteer to knock doors for these folks because we got to get our message out and the only way we're going to do that is if we galvanize and energize each other we all can't do it all the time i mean my god we just had a whole year off y'all didn't have to run up for office last year there were no campaigns in indiana last year y'all should be refreshed and ready to go i know i am and if you're not sure what you need to do hit me up holler at me and i will tell you how you can get involved with either party or candidate. There's plenty of opportunities for all as a community. And when I say community, I mean all six million Hoosiers. We are a community to get involved and help each other out and elect people who are going to write policies that are good for us That's and right. not trying to harm us. All right, Indiana's all day to black. That is turn left for this week. I'm tight. Oh my God. I will Thank holler you, at y'all next week. Peace. Thank you, Dana.